Hello lovely viewers, you are most welcome to our channel Poetry Online. In this video, we shall be discussing the detailed analysis of the poem Building the Nation by Christopher Henry Mwangabalu. Kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates on all our new videos. Once again, let us assure you of a very interesting discussion. Get ready for this lesson. Christopher Henry Mwangabalu was born on 1st May 1929. He was a Ugandan poet and one of the recipients of the Ugandan Golden Jubilee Medals in 2013. He was a civil servant and a poet. He is noted for his poem, Building the Nation. It is possible that his work as a civil servant enabled him to have an insight into what happened in the civil service. He died on 20th August 2006. The colonial experience of Africa is not an experience that Africa will forget in a hurry. It had both positive and negative effects. The negative effects are quite numerous, especially regarding the partition of Africa for Western interests, the rise in intertribal wars, secessions, environmental degradation as a result of the exploration and mining of natural resources like oil, gold, diamond, and the imposition of political leaders that rule according to the Western control among other factors, constitute the brain of Africa's underdevelopment. Many African nations fought for their independence because the Western powers refused to relinquish power to the African leaders in their own country. Why did the colonialists find it difficult to allow Africans to govern themselves? The basic answer was greed. They wanted to rule the world and acquire all of the natural and economic benefits of Africa. They saw Africans as subhumans who have no sense of culture and refinement. Unfortunately for the imperialists, the acquisition of Western education by Africans, which was introduced mainly for economic intentions, opened the critical minds of African intellectuals who reasoned that Africans should be allowed to decide and rule their own countries. After many years of slavery and colonization, the African continent is yet to witness the envisioned or projected independence, freedom, sustainable development, peace, wealth, and satisfaction they desired during the fight for colonial independence. This poem, Building the Nation, criticizes the so-called leaders, politicians, or big men who use their position to amass wealth, embezzle, and misappropriate state funds at the expense of the masses. This poem basically revolves around the lavish lifestyle of the ruling class in Africa who took over power after colonialism and ideally replaced the colonizers. Instead of these new leaders of Africa to inspire hope in Africans for a better future, they are rather caught up in the same evil and expensive lifestyle of their colonial masters. The point now remains that it was as if colonialism was removed and replaced with colonial attitudes, power, knowledge, politics, greed, and all manners of abuse. The masses now fight to restore sanity and cultural values of Africa. The masses suffer from the corruption which emanated from the imperialists and now been practiced by African ruling class. African writers, just like African historians, have been recording the African experience in independent African states. Independence to Africans marked a new dawn. It marked the beginning of greater things and hopes. It marked the hope for economic, social, cultural, and human development for the nations. It marked a new phase of history and experience. It marked the beginning of true politics by people for the people. It marks a period of reorientation from the shackles of colonialism to the goodness of internal rulership. It marks the end to Western slavery in governance. Independence is hoped to bring about peace and an end to rancor, greed, parochialism, anarchy, brutality, and economic sabotage. Independence is expected to accord Africans respect for being able to pilot their own affairs without interference. These dreams have become a stalemate as African leaders have been exhibiting the same 
if not worse than the colonial pattern of politics, the African intellectuals and ruling class are products of the same evil they fought against. African leaders are so busy amassing wealth that they forget the aspect of nation building, which is supposed to be their main focus. It is not wrong to state that all the problems the African continent is faced with today is as a result of the shameless hypocrisy of the people they have kept in high positions to rule over them. It is expected that these people will contribute positively to nation building and sustainable development. However, the narrative is different. After winning political power, they engage in all manner of practices that wreck the nation and put the masses to a disadvantage. Their attitude towards work has caused the African continent to retrogress instead of at worst stagnating, let alone making effort toward progression. African leaders who are supposed to be in the forefront of nation building, democracy, sustainable development, patriotism, and other laudable qualities rather do their work with a high level of hypocrisy or insincerity. They pose as angels in front of the masses, but behind the scenes, they engage in the dirty games of politics. African leaders consistently demonstrate their burning desire to acquire fame, power, and wealth by all means. Once elections are held, those who assume the mantle of leadership and read themselves within the shortest possible time. The irony of this poem lies in the reckless and devastating contribution the so-called nation builders contribute to their respective nations. Let's take our first reading of the poem. Today I did my share in building the nation. I drove the permanent secretary to an important agent function, in fact, to a luncheon at the Vic. The man reflected his importance, cold bell beer with small talk, then fried chicken with nices, wine to fill the holiness of the labs, ice cream to cover the stereotype jokes, coffee to keep the PS awake on the return journey. I drove the permanent secretary back. He yawned many times in the back of the car. Then, to keep awake, he suddenly asked, Did you have any lunch, friend? I replied, looking straight ahead and secretly smiling at his belated concern, that I had not, but was slimming. Upon which he said with a seriousness that amused more than annoyed me, On Wanachi, I too had none. I attended to matters of state, highly delicate diplomatic duties, you know, and friend, it goes against my grain, causes me stomach ulcer and win. Ah, he continued, yawning again. The pains will suffer in building the nation, so the PS had ulcer too. My ulcer, I think, are equally painful, only they are caused by hunger, no sumptuous lunches. So two nation builders arrived home this evening with terrible stomach pains, the result of building the nation different ways. After taking our first reading of the poem, let's continue with our analysis. Building the nation is a poem that raises serious concerns about the lifestyle of African elites or bourgeoisies who are zoned power after the majority of African countries became independent, the people had high hopes in their new leaders as they expected them to become beacons of democracy, beacons of peace, beacons of patriotism and peace setters. But they were disappointed as these leaders were caught up in the same lifestyle of the colonial masters. The discourse of nation building that should dominate the political scene and political policies and public discussions were shielded. The poem highlights the hypocrisy of the elites in their attempts to portray themselves as the heroes or real nation builders, when indeed they are wreckers of the nation. The title of the poem, Building the Nation, is ironic or deceptive in a way because readers immediately after reading the title, Building the Nation, paint a picture of a hero or heroes, or better still, 
patriotic citizens in their minds, and this hero or patriotic citizens are supposed to be builders, defenders, and protectors of the nation. However, the so-called builders of the nation can never be considered builders of the nation, but wreckers of the nation, because their actions shows exactly that. To clearly and efficiently present the message of the poem, the poet decides to use the driver and his superior, who is the permanent secretary of the state. The dichotomy of these two characters lies in their position and the level of contribution expected of them in the nation-building process. It is expected that the permanent secretary will be a shining example of all laudable qualities for others to emulate, but that is not the case. It is obvious that the permanent secretary's role in building the nation is more significant than that of the driver. Therefore, we all expect that the peers does all within its abilities and capabilities to lift high the flag of nation building by doing his work wholeheartedly. But the reverse of this is true. Another interesting thing about this poem is the fact that the two people whose lives are held up for scrutiny in the poem all suffer from stomach ulcer. The permanent secretary suffers from stomach ulcer not because he is busy with his position or he hardly gets any time to eat. No, he suffers from stomach ulcer as a result of overeating or as a result of eating sumptuous meals. The driver on the other hand suffers from stomach ulcer as a result of hunger and starvation. The nameless driver in the poem symbolizes the working class in Africa. The permanent secretary is a representative of the ideal elite class charged with managing the affairs of the African nations after independence. As a permanent secretary, it is his job to protect the traditions and cherished values of the African continent such as patriotism, honesty, hard work, diligence, commitment, and other laudable traits. But readers are shocked to find the opposite of all these laudable traits. Building the nation is a lyrical poem because it expresses the feelings and emotions of the driver. It focuses on the inward reactions, insights, or responses of the driver in relation to the attitude of the permanent secretary. Building the nation is also a narrative poem because it tells a story and presents a significant series of episodes in the life of the driver. As we said earlier, this poem is about the tragedy of African countries when they got the opportunity to rule themselves. Many countries after independence have been struggling to deal with myriad of problems such as corruption, poverty, and mismanagement of state funds. African leaders that took over power if their colonial masters by plundering and feeding fat on the resources of the continent. This poem is narrative as well as a dialogue between the permanent secretary and his driver that exposes the irony in building the nation. We encounter two major groups in the society, the masses represented by the driver who are the real nation builders and the elites or the bourgeoisie who had replaced the colonial masters immediately after independence. This group doubled in the same evil the colonizers had been accused of. There are various patterns of words in the poem to indicate that the poem is very direct, simple, and conversational. Words such as share, building, drove, important, and suffer are very simple and easy to understand. These are words that are used by the driver. There are other words that are high sounding, words such as highly, delicate, and diplomatic. These words underscore the hypocrisy of the peers. The significance of these words lies in the way in which they seem to contrast two opposing ideologies, which is widening the gap between the two characters. Perhaps the point which is to imply that we cannot build the nation on empty talk. It may be suggested that the words have been carefully selected to alert the masses about the deceit or the cunning nature of African leaders, or to inform us that 
African leaders as sweet talkers. We equally get the opportunity to assess the contribution of the permanent secretary and the driver since we are the ones the driver is reporting to. Building the nation is the point that has 34 unequal lines. There are shorter lines, and this might be suggestive of the power play, as there are more people in the lower bracket than there are politicians. The structure of the poem also foregrounds issues of hypocrisy, disillusionment, misplaced priorities, and wastage in the system. Let's take a stanza by stanza analysis of the poem, beginning with the first stanza. Today I did my share in building the nation. I drove the permanent secretary to an important urgent function, in fact, to a luncheon at the Vic. The poet opens the poem by introducing us to the driver of the permanent secretary, who tells us about what he does as a nation builder. It is his job to drive the permanent secretary, and today he is driving him to an important state meeting to deal with affairs of the nation. This meeting is labeled an important urgent meeting. Ironically, it turns out to be a luncheon at the Vic. The first stanza stresses on the wasteful nature of African leaders or the misuse of state resources. This meeting that was tagged an important urgent function ironically turns out to be a luncheon at the Vic. This stanza also highlights on the hypocrisy of African leaders. One would think that the so-called important urgent meeting or urgent function will have something to do with the affairs of the nation. Or, this is a meeting where issues concerning the nation are going to be discussed. But no, this is a luncheon at the Vic, the lavish lifestyle of politicians. Let's now move to the second stanza. The many reflected his importance, cold bell beer with small talk, then fried chicken with nices, wine to fill the holiness of the labs, ice cream to cover the stereotype jokes, coffee to keep the PS awake on the return journey. In the second stanza, the PS meets others in his class to have lunch with them. The persona, rather sarcastically, itemizes the details of the agenda for the important urgent function. He says, the menu reflected its importance, cold bell beer with small talk, then fried chicken with nineties, wine to fill the holiness of the love, ice cream to cover the stereotype jokes, coffee to keep the peers awake on the return journey. Indeed, the description is very absent for grounds the message of the poet, the lavish lifestyle of politicians and the triviality in the so-called important urgent function. It is instructive to note that the poet has succeeded in making the readers to salivate. This is the importance of imagery. Here, the poet uses powerful imagery. And this imagery helps us to see for ourselves and imagine or see in our mind's eye the kind of lavish lifestyle African politicians are living. The actions of the permanent secretary and his colleagues are so artificial because they are aping or imitating their colonial masters. Their laughs are described as hollow and their jokes look stale. The so-called important urgent function was a meeting held to attend to matters of the stomach and not the nation, all of which was done at the expense of the taxpayer. With a stung in his cheek, the driver sarcastically highlights the routine of such an important urgent function. This is how some African politicians label the numerous conferences, workshops, symposia, and conferences they attend. In the long run, issues about the plight of the masses are less unattended to as they are lost in matters of the stomach. What it simply means is that issues of national concern are lost in the lavish lifestyle of politicians. So, they are enjoying life to an extent that they don't see or feel the destitute, the poverty, the hunger, the starvation, and the numerous problems of the masses. Let's now move to the third stanza. I drove the permanent secretary back. 
He yawned many times in the back of the car. Then, to keep awake, he suddenly asked, Did you have any lunch, friend? I replied, looking straight ahead and secretly smiling at his belated concern, that I had not, but was slimming. Upon which he said with a seriousness that amused more than annoyed me. On Wanachi, I too had none. In this stanza, we realize that the needs of the driver does not cross the mind of the permanent secretary. He does not even package some food for his driver who drives him around. This is very symbolic of African leaders who do not care whether the working class get what they deserve as nation builders or not. The permanent secretary takes coffee to stay awake on the return journey. Also, he decides to engage in a conversation with the driver. The interaction is very instructive and symbolic. It highlights how important the masses are to the elites, as even in their impoverished state, they still support the elites despite their overfeeding. The permanent secretary, rather unknowingly and sarcastically, asks the driver if he has eaten anything. This is the highest form of mockery and hypocrisy. The two dichotomous group of African society are further highlighted. While the driver's ulcer are caused by hunger and starvation, those of the permanent secretary are caused by sumptuous lunches like what he had at the Vic. This is the price you pay for building the nation differently. Indeed, the national cake is not evenly distributed. This reveals the hypocrisy of many African leaders who always play on the intelligence of the masses, pontificating that they are doing their best to change the fortunes of the country. The vivid description of the menu foregrounds the hypocrisy of the elites. We also see the hypocrisy of the permanent secretary, who asks or decides to talk to the driver not because he cares about him, but because he doesn't want to sleep on their return journey. So, he decides to engage him in a conversation. And instead of asking of any other thing, he decides to ask if the driver has eaten, knowing very well that the driver has not eaten. This is typical of African politicians. The important urgent function turns out to be a luncheon. The permanent secretary and his cohorts wine and dine using stage resources. This revealed the hypocrisy of many African leaders who always play on the intelligence of the masters. When the permanent secretary says, Did you have any lunch, friend? We descend his insincerity. Why does he refer to the driver as friend? Is the driver really his friend? The permanent secretary goes on to say, Owanachi, I too had none. I attended to matters of the state. This statement rather amused more than annoying the driver. By referring to the driver as friend, the permanent secretary was echoing his insincerity, pretending to say that they shared the same ideology and were both together in the struggle to build the nation. Indeed, this is the case of Monkey the Wack, Bamboo the Chop, a popular saying that demonstrates the inequality of the society. The poem, Building the Nation, shows how some African leaders have turned themselves into leeches, feeding on the blood and toil of the masses. This is their way of building the nation, based on hypocrisy and insincerity. Let's now move to the fourth stanza. I attended to matters of state, highly delicate diplomatic duties, you know, and friend, it goes against my grain, causes me stomach ulcer and win. Ah! He continued, yawning again. The pains will suffer in building the nation. So the PS had also too. My ulcer, I think, are equally painful. Only they are caused by hunger. No sumptuous lunches. The two dichotomous groups of African societies are further highlighted. While the driver's ulcer are caused by hunger and starvation, those of the permanent secretary are caused by sumptuous lunches. This is the price they pay for building the nation differently. 
the driver does his diligently, while the permanent secretary squanders national resources. Indeed, the national cake is not evenly distributed. The driver sarcastically retorts, so the PS had also too. My also, I think, are equally painful. Only they are caused by hunger, not some short lunches. It is important to note that you hear African leaders asking the masses to tighten their belts as a result of the austerity measures to stabilize their economies while they themselves losing their belts. We also realize that the real nation builders work under very harsh economic conditions causing them stomach ulcer and wind, while their leaders wine and dine, claiming they are also building the nation. This is the highest form of disappointment and disillusionment. The message from the poem has been clearly stated. Nation building is a duty of all and not a preserve of the masses. The poem is relevant to any African country. So two nation builders arrived home this evening with terrible stomach pains, the result of building the nation different ways. In the last stanza of the poem, we see that the masses are disillusioned and also disappointed in their leaders. The call to nation building is interpreted differently by the permanent secretary and the driver. People who are committed to the process are disillusioned and disappointed by those who are to implement the policies. The driver is disappointed and disillusioned because the important urgent function turns out to be a luncheon at the Vic. This is a reflection of the trivial nature of the meeting. There is the abuse of power, corruption, and therefore the driver is disappointed and disillusioned. The permanent secretary uses them to keep awake on their return journey after the luncheon. Indeed, the poet has in a sarcastic tone succeeded in amassing the ills of the ruling class that have been hidden from the masses. He has exposed the rot in the society and is asking his compatriots to remain focused. What do you make of the driver's composure and attitude during the trip with the permanent secretary? Why didn't he abandon the permanent secretary at the Vic? What lesson can be drawn from his action? The lesson to be drawn is that, no matter one's station in a society, one must continue to perform one's role. If you are a teacher, you must not say that because the head teacher in your school is not working efficiently or is not working properly, you will not also work. Thus, we have to do our part in building the nation. The driver is telling all of us that we have different roles and must work to build the nation. Let's now consider the major themes of the poem. The theme of hypocrisy or insincerity of African leaders. Hypocrisy and insincerity have been a vital tool for most politicians when they want to win more votes from the ignorant masses. They make heap of lies on the optimistic crowds, but eventually, everything turns out to be a nightmare. The permanent secretary lies to the driver that he did not have any mail, just as a driver. Yet, you and I know that he had a very heavy and sumptuous mail. He even shows his shameless hypocrisy more clearly and vividly when he asks a question. Did you have any lunch, friend? He asks a question. Did you have any lunch, friend? It is rather sad to note that he does not ask whether the driver has eaten anything because he is concerned about his welfare, but it is simply to keep himself awake throughout the journey. Next is the theme of disillusionment or disappointment. The kind of disillusionment portrayed in the poem is that which Africans have towards their leaders who have adopted the very tenets of the colonizers from whom they got power. Essentially, the idea of nation building turns out to be a very complicated phenomenon where those who are central to the process have their efforts wasted by leaders who can implement policies. The persona 
shows his disillusionment by stating that, at the meeting, the meaning reflected his importance, called Bell Bier with small talks, then fried chicken with niceties, wine, ice cream, coffee. This reflects the triviality of the meeting where serious issues were supposed to be discussed. Let's now move to the misuse of state resources. The persona shows that the permanent secretary goes to the meeting where important matters were supposed to be discussed. Instead of discussing things of national interest, all that the permanent secretary and his friends do is to go and eat, cracking jokes and laughing. If we need to do well at nation building, we must respect everything that belongs to the state. We must not misuse public funds, the working hours and the state properties, like cars, for our own interest. The permanent secretary goes to feast or goes to the vic using the government car, and after the feast, he is driven back home. So, he wastes not only public resources, but also working hours. Let's now discuss the theme of marginalization. Thoroughly depicts two classes in one society. There is a high class and the lower class. Both of them are supposed to mutually benefit from the national resources. Yet, the high class that is presented by the permanent secretary exploits the lower class that are more often than not comprises those involved in the modes of production. For example, the chauffeur or the driver drives a permanent secretary to the place where he is eaten, while the driver does not take part in eating. Both the high class and lower class have a role in building the nation, but the high class has just become the parasite who is feeding fat on the national resources at the expense of the masses. They are neither building the nation nor comforting the masses or suiting them of their pain. All they do is demonstrate shameless hypocrisy and build their stomach. Let's now discuss the theme of exploitation. The two parties or people presented in the poem represent the two strands of nation builders or the two types of nation builders that are in most African states. On one side, there are those represented by the driver or the masters, while on the other, we have the high class represented by the permanent secretary. The latter is busy squandering the public funds which can be used to rebuild the nation. The masses are the hard-working people whose benevolence is easily taken for granted by those in power. There are those who eat extravagantly and those who work on empty stomachs. The persona knows about the exploitation done by African leaders and informs his fellow countrymen about what is actually happening in the country. Let's now discuss the literary devices employed in the poem. Alliteration In the poem, we come across the following Cold bell beer The repetition of the bell sound in bell and beer Secretly smiling The repetition of the sir sound in secretly and smiling Highly delicate diplomatic duties the reputation of the the sound in delicate, diplomatic, and duties. Next is onomatopoeia. This is the effect created by words that imitate sounds. The following extract has onomatopoeic effects. Ah, he continued yawning again. The sound of the yawning helps the readers to hear and also see the permanent secretary sitting lazily in a chauffeur-driven vehicle. Irony Indeed, the whole poem is an irony. Throughout the poem, there is a sense of building a nation, but in the end, we are shocked to find out that what is said to be building the nation is nothing but a hoax. Contrast The poem uses contrast to convey its message there are instances in contrast in words and ideas. There is a contrast in building the nation, 
either through sacrifice or through overfeeding. There is also the idea of ulcer caused by hunger and another caused by overeating or sumptuous meals. The contrast reinforces the idea of building the nation in the eyes of the permanent secretary and his driver. Thus, they all see the process or the act of building the nation differently. Sarcasm Sarcasm permeates throughout the poem, especially when the permanent secretary refers to the luncheon as an important urgent function and highly delicate diplomatic duties. The exclamation, so the PS has also too, is very sarcastic, that is, somebody who is overeaten or somebody who has some short meals having stomach ulcer, isn't this sarcastic? The driver retorts when asked if he had had lunch. I replied, looking straight ahead and smiling secretly at his belated concern that I had not but was slimming. Notice the use of the words belated concern. The permanent secretary's response, amused more than annoying the driver, also serves as sarcasm. Satire This poem is a political satire that criticizes the lavish and extravagant lifestyle of African leaders who claim to be doing their best in building the nation when in actual sense they are wrecking the nation. Mood The mood of the poem is that of anger, condemnation and disapproval of the lavish lifestyle of the ruling class. Tone The tone of the poem is both sad and ironical or satirical. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share this video.